Coming up on this week's episode of the Retro Hour podcast, how a Tamagotchi could be your ultimate party partner. Why you should be wearing floppy disks this season. And we get the inside story of Conker's Bad Fur Day. Hello and welcome to the Retro Hour podcast, episode number 179, your weekly dose of retro gaming and technology news with me, Dan Wood. Me, Ravi Abbott. And me, Joe Fox. And welcome to this week's show. Now, this is a podcast where we get our nostalgia on every week. We reminisce about old school games. We talk about the goings on in the world of retro. <laughs> chair dancing as well. We're chair dancing for some reason. <laughs> I was going along with it. It was exciting, isn't it? <laughs> it we was. Doing this show. It was. And also, we do events all around the world as well. And I do say all around the world because, um, admittedly, we'll be honest, the magic of podcasting, we are recording this before we actually go to Norway. And by the time this comes out, we will have been at Retro Spill Messen last weekend. And I'll be in Brazil. Yeah, so <laughs> all over the place. Uh, but we were at an amazing retro gaming event, Retro Spill Messen, where we hosted three panels. Fingers crossed all the technology worked and we recorded it. We've got a decent track record these days of doing that. Yeah. So this week, we are going to bring you one of the panels that we did there, getting the story of Conker's Bad Fur Day. Now... You probably remember that game on the Nintendo 64. At first glance, it did look a bit like all of the other cutesy animal-based platform games that were around at the time until you actually played it. And it turned out that Conker was um, a little bit X-rated, quite mature in many ways, which, um, a little disclaimer, if you have got young ones listening with you today, this might be a little bit more um, adult than a lot of our usual podcasts, but it is such an interesting story. The development of Conker's Bad Fur Day from Chris Marlowe and Sean Pyle, formerly of Rare, recorded live at Retro Spill Messen in Norway last weekend, and we'll be bringing you that on the show in around 15 minutes from now. Now, if you can't get enough, Ravi Abbott, as if you're not busy enough doing the Retro Hour podcast, doing your 8-bit Amiga Mix show thing that you do as well, you're also going to be on another podcast now as well with a good friend of ours. Now, we've actually got him on the line now. Uh, let's cross over to sunny Atlanta in America and welcome Dr. Adam Spring to the show. Hello, Adam. Well, thank you very much, boys. And I must say, you know, you did actually talk about me on episode number one, so I feel like this is coming full circle. Yeah, that was a while ago, wasn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> well, Adam, I mean, you know, we're obviously good mates as well, Adam, but you do a really good podcast called Remotely Interested that you've done for a few years now, actually. And it kind of, we do have a bit of a crossover in terms of the things that we cover, uh, but you're generally a bit more about, I mean, you cover a lot of like geek culture and science. I mean, it, there's, it's quite a broad spectrum of things that you talk about in your show. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, there's obviously there's synergy there because, uh, as I've said to Ravi and yourself before, Dan, you know, we come from the same wow source of growing up in Britain at a time when micros and video game culture, we were just a bit spoilt, really. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I've I've had guests like John Matheson, who hardware designer of the Atari Jaguar, but at the same time now does a lot of stuff at NVIDIA. So we kind of talk about what people are doing now. I mean, Glenn Keller is a similar one as well. He did the Paula chip in the Amiga, now working on camera sensors for Fovian. And then, of course, did get AVGN as well. So talking to James Rolfe, that was kind of really cool. Yeah, and I think the cool thing about this podcast, because it's monthly, and basically I'm in England and you're in America, so you're getting loads of mad interviews. Like, the latest one, we're doing a wrestling episode, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm actually editing that together as well at the moment, ironically enough. Yeah, so there's a wrestling school, and it turns out the trainer now is part of the company that's the main rival to WWE. A guy by the name of Tony Khan has invested $100 million wow. into AEW, All Elite Wrestling, and Mike is involved. So I just happened to walk in his door one day and we started talking. Well, you've been doing this podcast solo for like, what, four years now, isn't it, Adam? You've been doing it a while. Started it in 2014, and as you guys know doing it weekly is a very difficult thing and I started to yeah. do that initially and I tried to do that and there's no way you can do that on your own so over a period of time it's it's evolved it went from me and a guy by the name of Trevor he then moved and then I did it on my own and over the years it's kind of mixed it up you know I've got sound bites in some of them say for instance with James Rolfe I've got also in there the producer of the angry video game nerd movie that's a friend of his Kim Justice as well is also in there talking about him and I can't remember who the other one is, but there's someone else in there as well, I think. Well, now you're going to be joined by Ravi as well every month. I know. I, I'm sorry. I'm, you know, I'm not taking him away from you guys in any way, shape or form. Just... Oh, it's nice to have a break. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, you know, it's uh, it's nice having somebody to bounce off. You know, when you're doing it on your own, you really do have to be inventive of like, it's just me talking. But how do I make that interesting when I'm I'm clearly talking to people as a listener, but when you're in the room and you're talking to yourself, it's like, am I really that good a company? Yeah, so if you folks want to check out this podcast, it's at www.remotely-interested.com and it's also on most of the services that you'll find the retro app. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, lo- I love the fact that Adam and me are like, we're, we're Atari Jaguar bros as well. You know, the only other guy I know collects for the Atari Jaguar. So. Oh, absolutely. I, <laughs> I absolutely love my Jaguar. At the moment, funny story, actually, going back to wrestling. There's actually a wrestler in the US. A couple of them have got a, a YouTube channel. And I actually, I know the, the retro gaming store that he goes to. And I actually contacted them one day and I said, look, can you stop him talking about Atari Jaguar on YouTube because he's driving prices up? I haven't got a copy of Atari cards yet. <laughs> it's his fault. I was like, here's, literally, I was like, here's my phone number. If he needs anything, let me know. It's not rare. <laughs> Body slam him. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. Thank you very much, boys. So if people want to check out that, where do they get the show from? Uh, it's www.remotelyinterested.com. Or at that interested. I love the way he still did the WWW. Oh, of course. Yeah. Right, he's old school through yeah. and through, isn't he? <laughs> the free W's. <laughs> if World you, Wide Web. <laughs> if you're really old school, HTTP colon forward slash forward slash. And that's too insecure. It's going to be HTTPS. Right. No, okay. I was going to say, do you ever, were you ever in a situation <laughs> Sorry, where you... Sorry, that was too geeky. We lost all the audience yeah. now. Yeah. That was too... That was a Chrome joke. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, have you ever been in a situation when you were in like school or uni or whatever, and you had, you were that desperate, you had to write down a website and use the whole like HTTP <laughs> at freeserve.com. Yeah, yeah. like, oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> I remember back in the day, you know, you'd often get listings or, well, they're kind of like listings in um in magazines of like you know they do these hot websites of the week mm. and you'd look and you'd like type them in oh check that website out <laughs> and often it was like that it was like about yeah 20 subdomains forward slashes tildes all kinds of things that you put in <laughs> then it wouldn't work in, invariably so i uh had a copy of retro gamer magazine about i think it was about nine years ago now on holiday in cyprus and they had a part at the end of all these great fantastic retro gaming websites i was like oh fantastic <laughs> couldn't get any of them to work <laughs> other retro gaming fans out there somewhere <laughs> on the internet now actually if you are um, you know on your browser or on your phone right now you might have a look at our website as well the retrohour.com that will look quite Similar to the uh, remotely interested page, because they're both made by you. Oh, yes. Um, there is a little link there if you'd like to help support the Retro Hour podcast. Now, of course, this show comes out every week into our fourth year of doing the show now, but we couldn't have made it this far without your support. And any donation that we get, I mean, actually, there are lots of ways you can support this show. Um, it's not just monetary. I mean, you know, often doing a little retweet or tagging your friends about Facebook. Or posts. a review on um, Apple Podcasts or, yeah. you know, sharing on Facebook. It's really all helpful. Yeah, and the Apple one, actually, you mentioned that. I mean, that is kind of, um, it used to be the iTunes chart, but now, you know, renaming it to the Apple Podcast chart. It is really where, I mean, that's kind of like, you know, the top 40 of podcasts, isn't it? It's yeah. like the official chart. So, I mean, if you do help, you know, help us out on there, leaving us a review or a five-star rating, it gets a show in front of new people. That's really appreciated. So, anyway, you can get the word out there or just retweeting or reposting one of our social media posts or help. Tag you your mates in there. join our community at Discord and chat with us. Absolutely. Or if you'd like to make a little donation into the running of the show as well, that really helps out, pay for all our server costs and distribution costs and everything too. And any amount that we get, of course, 100% goes back into the running of the podcast. And you can make a donation via PayPal at Dead Easy. The address is actually PayPal at theretrohour.com. Com, or we do have a little supporters link if you want to do it directly through our website at theretrohour.com. And any amount you donate will earn you a shout in a future episode in the very prestigious, there is no more prestigious high score table in the world of retro gaming. Joe knows that. I know this. Ravi knows it. Yeah, we all I know, know this. I know it. And you will get your place in there. Now, this week, we want to say a big thank you to Stefan Rima, Gary Heather. Philip Blanchard and our good friend Paul Kitchen who all made donations into the running of the show and you can do the same at theretrohour.com Now, did you have a Tamagotchi back in the day? Oh, naturally, I had yeah. about three Yeah, how Tam- long did they normally last then before they died? Juggling them to keep them alive <laughs> I couldn't handle one, <laughs> I, not I, very long I remember my dad was a lecturer and he had one he said it beeped in the middle of a lecture and he had to say to his class I've got to go feed my Tamagotchi <laughs> and he ran and fed it For God's sake, I remember we went on a holiday when they first came out and we went to the Lake District and for some reason my parents decided to drive via Blackpool on the way home to get us all the Tamagotchi. No way. <laughs> and the buttons fell out of them the next day. <laughs> we didn't, didn't win them at one of those like one pound machines. Or <laughs> Probably. <laughs> well, Tamagotchi's always seemed like a kind of kid's game, you know, an innocence and you can just play with it and have your little virtual We've pet. all grown up now though. We've all grown up now, so they've managed to combine a breathalyzer and a Tamagotchi right. uh, in Japan and the, the word for being drunk in Japan, I'm going to say this really badly, is Yopo Ari. And this is the Yopo Ari-chi. Did you get, <laughs> did you get Yopo Ari much when you were out in Japan recently, Joe? Um, 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and to think about that, what did yes, I do in Japan the again? night before my 30th birthday. <laughs> Uh, what was it, Yap- Yaparachi? Yeah. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, with this one, what you can do is you, your Tamagotchi can drink along with you, so you can choose <laughs> beer and wine, and then as you consume your beer and wine, your Tamagotchi gets more drunk. And you literally just breathe into the breathalyzer bit on the top. Yeah, yeah, and it checks the alcohol level, and then, like does that to your Tamagotchi but also your Tamagotchi can vomit everywhere <laughs> and you have to clean you can up kill it from alcohol poisoning the quickest <laughs> you have to clean up the mess afterwards it's I fantastic. love the little animations they have on there as well <laughs> like a little smiley Tamagotchi get a pint poured into its mouth yeah. and it's got those little rosy cheeks on it too and it's kind of cute I do want one yeah and I, I think it's just actually blow yeah, uh, yeah, just your breath. Yeah, they That's do look breath. cool. That would be amazing once they hit the there's UK. Like a, there's like a, just a small filter on the top, isn't it? And you just blow into it. Imagine if the police pulled you over. <laughs> pulled out a Tamagotchi. <laughs> That's it, sir. You're wasted. <laughs> <laughs> this Tamagotchi is up the scales. <laughs> <laughs> it means you never have to drink alone again, Joe. Look at that. Look Absolutely. At that, yeah. There we go. I wasn't alone. <laughs> 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 to think about that. Then, I have you? friends. <laughs> <laughs> I know your wife was there, yes, sitting next of to you, course. disapproving looks. How much you'd spent on games? <laughs> oh God, yeah, she did. <laughs> now the Atari ST is um, a platform that we've talked about in this show before. Have you? We but, cover the ST. I found this story about uh, a new book that's coming about out about the ST, and it's called Faster Than Light: The ST and the 16-Bit Revolution. Yeah. And this looks awesome. It's talking all about the very specific stuff that the ST had, which you know everybody says it was good for sound and. They had built-in MIDI, but they were also really good at notation on the screens, and later ones had a DSP chip in yeah. there. So, you know, they were really nice. Cubase, that was the... Uh, started on there. Started software. So Fatboy Slim did all his uh, Rockefeller skank and everything on the ST. And uh, this book's just came out on Amazon, and it looks really awesome. So this is called When the, the Atari ST Was the Future of Computing. Um, faster than light, the Atari ST in the 16-bit revolution. And it's only well, $17.99 in paperback. Um, and looks like they probably do digital copies and all that, I imagine, too. And the thing is, I, I actually do like that they're doing a book about the ST because, you know, we, the Amigas had so many books and yeah, stuff. Yeah, I've, I've got a big stack of Amiga books yeah. at home. I've got a few Atari ones, but they all seem to be focused on the Atari arcades or yeah. the classic old-school Atari stuff like the yeah. 2600s, not the 16-bit era. Yeah, but, that... but also, you know, the ST was released before the Amiga. Yeah. And it really kind of was that beauty machine. Yeah, exactly. So um, if you want to get a copy of that book, we'll uh, shove it in our show notes, the Amazon link at theretrohour.com. That was your birthday recently, Joe. It was. Did indeed. you have a cake? Wow. I don't know yet because of my party is actually this weekend. <laughs> Which you guys are not attending because <laughs> you're in Norway. I miss so, Joe's birthday every year. He, so this is like the, <laughs> oh, I don't know, how many years in a row? Third or fourth. Third right. or fourth. I didn't think I was going to get shamed on the podcast this week. <laughs> well, this is your so, birthday party. This is my birthday yeah. party right now. So, I got your chocolate bar, didn't so, I? So, <laughs> yes, this is true. So, luckily, um, Dan's wife will be at the party. Yep. So she will be able to describe the cake to you <laughs> upon your return. <laughs> well, I bet it won't be as cool as this cake. No, it probably won't be. It'll probably be just a, uh, what's that, Percy Caterpillar or something. Well, I, I was searching I was searching for news and I found this on Perth Now, which is a kind of Australian news site. Yeah. And there's this amazing queen of cakes, Julie Raffala, and she kind of creates these cakes in Perth and she's just made a Commodore 64 one and... The joystick looks so real. <laughs> I didn't, so, that joystick is cake. I can't believe it. So Ra- Ravi sent this over and I opened it and I thought it was, at a glance, it was just, you know, it was a Commodore 64. And then when I looked at it again, I was like, oh, that Commodore 64 looks ever so slightly wonky. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, wait, it's a cake. <laughs> like, what's going on here? Now, this is a classic bread bin style Commodore 64. It's got a 1541 floppy drive next you, to it as well. You'd eat that floppy drive, wouldn't you? Oh, I can slice out of that. That'd be delicious. Um, An Atari style joystick next to it, quite randomly. But also, what's really cool is they've actually got some basic code on the be- on the cake stand as well. Um, it says, ready, load Stuart's 40th birthday, comma, eight, comma, one. So, I, that's so well done, though, isn't it? You, you remember my mum's um, cake that she made for us after the first year that was like... Oh, I a, about that, an a, Amiga cake. A melted Amiga, yeah. Oh, and you brought it in and forced it on us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, this, this, I'm sorry, mum, but this tops it. Yeah, but, but thanks for having his mum. It was nice. Yeah, yeah, She's never done this a cake since. No, we, we, yeah, should well, have a, we should have a bake-off. Third anniversary. Yeah. yeah. Slacking a bit, your mum. Come on, <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> 
Now, we've talked about cakes this week. We've talked about books. What about something you wear? Yeah, so this is another totally random story. Sorry I'm coming with the random ones this week, but I just thought, this is funny. So like, Ravi comes at me, have you ever worn a floppy disk, Joe? It's kind of been fashion week, and uh, Prada have been going around in yep. Shanghai, and they've been showing all their latest designer clothes, and uh, the, the theme seems to be floppy disks at the moment. <laughs> so they've got this one guy, and his jacket's completely covered in floppy disks, but they're also saying that... This new media, uh, it's not literal floppy disks, it's pictures of them, yeah. but this this new media of print, kind of print style, is uh, the new fashion. And uh, brightly coloured analogue cassettes, 80s VHS camcorders, boxy jackets and bowling <laughs> shirts. So <laughs> retro is literally I'm just going hoping there's going to be a nice resurgence in 80s fashion. Because I've always loved 80s fashion. You know what, early 80s fashion... Pretty cool. But then when you get to kind of late 80s and it was like shell suits, yeah. bum bags, which actually do seem to be coming back. Bum bags. Randomly, I keep seeing people wearing bum bags, but wearing them over the shoulder across the chest. So where I work, there's a, quite a few young lads who work there and I do see the bum bags over the shoulder. Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, yeah, oh, you know, what is that? I'm that, sat in like my office. So like, well, I say my office. That, that's, <laughs> I'm, sat, I'm sat across the office and I'm just like, what is that? That's because like, they all want to look like a road man. That's yeah, what it is. yeah, but, that's what it is. <laughs> well, the the main thing I loved about yeah, I loved about eighties fashion was the power dressing. So the huge shoulder pads, <laughs> <are> the, um, <laughs> display, suits, display yeah. your dominance with some shoulder pads. Yeah. <laughs> you come in next week like that, Ravi. Yeah. <laughs> huge perm. <laughs> You peacocking over there, yeah. <laughs> peacocking. Uh, yeah, but it, it's so random that kind of the, even floppy disks like being displayed at a Prada catwalk show. It just proves how like mainstream kind of retro is becoming now. I actually had a friend, I've got a friend of mine, Neil, who listens to our show, actually lives in Dubai. And um, he posted a picture actually, they've got Virgin Megastore still out in Dubai. Oh, wow. And they've started selling 90s albums on cassette tape in the last couple of weeks in there. Wow. Yeah, see, what, you know, like here, you get vinyl and everything. They should do an albums in Virgin Megastore out on cassette. Very yeah, so. That's interesting. It's all this uh, looking back to the past to try and find out what's going to be new, and it's a I, I weird just, thing. I just want to know how many people are going to see that jacket, that Prada jacket, and go, oh, the save icon's on there. The save button's <laughs> on it. <laughs> Well, of course, if Prada would like to, uh, you know, sponsor a popular <laughs> yeah, retro yeah. gaming podcast, then uh, we are open to offers. So if you want to check that out, we'll put that and everything else we talked about this week in our show notes at theretrohour.com. Right then, are you ready for the main bit? Recorded live at Retro Spill Messen in Norway last weekend. This is such a good one. Chris Marlowe and Sean Pyle, formerly of Rare, giving us the story of the legendary Conker's Bad Fur Day. Enjoy. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a brilliant weekend at Retro Spill Messen so far. Uh, my name's Dan Wood. I'm Ravi Abbott. And we host a weekly retro gaming podcast from the UK called The Retro Hour. Now, you can get it from uh, wherever you normally get your podcasts from or our website, theretrohour.com. And what we do is we talk about what's been happening in the world of retro gaming over the last week, and then we're joined by a special guest on our show every week. Now, these are veterans who've helped shape the games and companies that we grew up playing, and that's what we're doing this weekend at Retro Spill Messen. Now, the game that we're going to be talking about for the next hour... I should just say, if there are any uh, young people in the audience, the game uh, and our guests as well, in fact, are rated mature. So uh, there may be some adult themes discussed. But please give a warm welcome to our guests to talk about Conker's Bad Fur Day, Chris Marlowe and Sean Pyle. So we're, we're going to start with some questions and we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Now, let's talk about Conker, uh, the character, because originally he was a character on um, Diddy Kong Racing. So what was the idea behind making his own game, and where did the character come from? Well, uh, really, we would, we'd started uh, a game called 12 Tales, uh, and that's where the character originally came from. And we were still developing 12 Tales when Diddy Kong Racing was being developed, and at that point, it was like getting all the all-stars of Rare, and it's going to be the, the new IP that was going to go out, so we're going to put this cutie little um, squirrel in the racing game. It's going to be lovely. And unfortunately, it didn't turn out like that. So uh, oh, we have wrong. some uh, awkward history in Diddy Kong Racing of the uh, the character that never quite made it to the uh, to the full game. Well, we all know that Mario sixty four was like a completely revolutionary game, and same with Banjo and Kazooie. What kind of influence did you guys draw from those titles? 
Well, um, Mario, of course, was a massive uh, influence for us. It, 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 that was the game that, that that we had in the office that we looked and went, wow, they've, they've nailed that first time out the gate. That's amazing. Banjo, we, we, were, we were developing Conquer at the same time as we were developing Banjo. Uh, Banjo came out first, but um, as we lived in little separate silos and... <laughs> We're never allowed to look at each other. Um, we weren't influenced by Banjo at all because... Um, this it, is being very diplomatic here. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. So um, we, we were doing 12 Tales and we were quite... We were a long way into it, weren't mm -hmm. we? And there was a game at Rare called Dream. And it was this sort of mythical game that none of us had ever seen. And we'd heard so much about. And they came and they saw what we were doing. And we kind of really taken the Mario stuff and, and sort of given it a, a boost. So we'd, we'd sort of smoothed out some rough edges and stuff like this. And so Dream got transformed, as it were, into Banjo. So it, Dream was kind of a 2.5D game, and it became a 3D game because we already started doing a, a good 3D game. So we were actually quite a long way into 12 Tales before Banjo turned into Banjo. We, we did have sort of a, quite a, a magical day because, as I say, we all the barns and all the games were very separated with our individual companies and no one's allowed to talk to each other or see each other. And then we had this really, really odd day where the whole of the Banjo dev team got sh shoveled into one of our offices and they went, do it like that. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> they, they, they just saw what we were doing and then they went off and made a really great game, uh, but they made it much faster than we could. Yes, they made it faster. <laughs> we could make a game and then... We took the five-year route. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess at some point during the time they were developing Banjo, we, we split and we became Bad Fur Day. Well, um, it was quite a long development cycle and originally being aimed at a kind of young audience, you also created a title which was um, called Conker's Pocket Tale as well. Yeah, um, well, not us, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rare, we, Could we you tell us credit. about that game and the kind of uh, where it came from? Well, uh, well I, I guess, you know, Rara was always doing Game Boy Advance stuff and, and uh, they just saw it as another IP, we, we need to get a game out. So we had nothing to do with it whatsoever. So they kind of, they based it roughly around what we, where we thought we were going to go with 12 Tales. And lots uh, of balloons. Yeah, yeah, and stuff like that. And they, they just went off. They were a separate team. And again, because Rare is this sort of gated development where you don't go and see what anybody else is doing. You, yeah, we never saw it. Never it just arrived. It. We saw, like, just suddenly turned up. They went, yeah, oh, yeah, it turned that's up. Good. We went, oh, that's cool. Uh, we, we've changed what yeah. we're doing. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's, I would change that around a bit. Yeah, but, and it's um, no longer relevant, but um, sorry. <laughs> I mean, you know, looking at that game, that was, you know, like a family-friendly game. And then, obviously, the main game that came out on the N64 was very mature-rated yeah. and adult-themed. What kind of inspired that decision to make him like a grown-up character yeah. and a, a well, game for adults? Well, it was an it's an interesting point you were saying the other question about a long development. I always think of Conquer as being both a long and a short development cycle for a rare game. Because although, overall, from the very start of it, we spent five years on it, from the point it switched to being um, Conquest Bad Fur Day, it was only about two and a half years from yeah. the thing. So we actually put it together quite quickly, but with a two and a half year prototyping phase that we chucked away. Uh, and we, we threw, I mean, the, some of the basic mechanics were in there, but everything got thrown, every big, almost every graphic, everything was completely redone from the yeah. start. And that was mostly from the fact that at the time it was hard to differentiate. We'd gone through E3 showing off 12 Tales and, um, we were just sort of surrounded by QT platformers, just everything we knew Banjo was, Banjo was getting close to completion, and it was just everything. We needed something different. Chris wanted something different. Yeah, I guess um, we were going to fall under a sort of a Banjo clone, and, and we really needed to do something with a bit of edge, and um, we'd kind of had a bit of a trouble design-wise because Chris Siever didn't do 12 Tales. And then Chris was handed the job of, like, see what you can do to redesign this. You've got, you know, a couple of months. And we did the beehive. So you get the beehive, you take it back. The beehive s shoots some guns out and kills everybody. And, um, and really, that was the key. Once we did that, that kind of edgy humor, the, the stampers just went, come back when you've done loads more of that. Yeah, we just want more of that. Yeah. Because we, we, we end up with the cutscene at the end and the, and the, the idea of shoot, you know, the guns coming out and all that kind of stuff. It was that edgy humour that yeah. they went, oh, yeah, yeah. run with that, because that was quite funny. You made him laugh. And we'd watched a lot of South Park 
And, yeah. and that was kind of like, <laughs> here we go. Yeah. Unfortunately, right, so you go off and do more of that, and then you disappeared for two years and came back, yeah, and they went, went well, oh this is what God. it is. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? Did you have some of the team coming from Killer Instinct as well? So would they have more of a kind of yeah. violent... <laughs> well, I, I say that. We, we, we carried across... There were three programmers that came from Killer Instinct, Mark Betteridge, Mike Currington and uh, Tony Wong. So they were kind of the, they were the seniors. They, they, Mark had certainly been there like 20 years. Tony had been there, you know, like three or four. And so they took us under their wing because we were, we joined straight from university. So the first game we were on was, was 12 Tales and... Yeah, we, we, so we, the tail end of Killer Instinct Gold, we were there, yeah. but sort of making cups of yeah, tea. Yeah, it wasn't exactly being the most helpful to finish a shipping game. You, you don't want to put your junior programmers on. Yeah. A few and, weeks before your game ships. And so. certainly Mark Betteridge was, was one of the owners of Rare. And his humour kind of meshed with Chris Seavers later on. So Mark was all for the violent stuff. Let's put some more in, right? And Mark wrote most of the movement. Well, all the movement code in the game. So he's a genius at that, that style. You could always push. So Mark would push Chris. Come on, let's, let's up it a bit more and have a bit more of this and that. So, yeah, it was good to carry them across. They were, they were super experienced guys and we certainly learned a lot from them so i was thinking of nintendo in the 90s you know i remember when like mortal kombat came out on the super nintendo and the blood had to be removed and they're always very careful about that kind of family friendly approach to games and then rare seemed to get away with a bit more i mean you know obviously stuff like killer instinct and goldeneye do you think rare had a bit more of a creative license to get away with a bit more than like say for example third party publishers may uh, yeah definitely um nintendo were very hands-off so pretty much they knew that the stampers were always going to produce a quality game. Rare was full of people that would make quality. So they kind of let Rare do their thing. They didn't interfere. They would only turn up, you know, perhaps once every six months, something like that. So it was really hands off. And, and they, they had a lot of respect. There was mutual respect. They knew, you know, and certainly Rare was selling, you know, millions and millions of games. So... They kind of let, we sort of slipped through. <laughs> they didn't get to see us <laughs> until a bit yeah. later on. They may have been uh, more worried than we ever found out. I think yeah, there's a lot yeah, was probably, probably sheltered from us. And they went, yeah, no, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah, and Nintendo were going, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah, they were pretty good for that as well. The, the team was kind of kept away from any politics outside, you know, we just got on with our jobs. And there was very little that we had to cut or remove. So Yeah, yeah. We end. pushed, we, we overstepped the mark a few times and uh, had to be reined back in. But Probably for the best. <laughs> uh, I was wondering, did you get any, any kind of trouble for parodying stuff? Because I've, I've got a big list here. It's uh, well, 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 Courage, This is one Terminator. of the great things about, about Conquer. Like, so uh, the, the, the thing I was thinking about was like the Matrix section where we did that, the, the full cutscene Matrix kind of shop shop remake of the cutscene thing like that. And then... Not short, quite shortly after Con came out, the the Matrix game was made, and that had cost like I, I don't know how many millions, millions. Yeah. how many millions the license cost, far more than they ever made back from the game, and we were thinking, God, yeah, we should have paid for licenses for that, don't you think? And but fortunately, Nintendo, uh, the lawyers who were very hot on this sort of stuff, had said, well, actually, well, it turns out, fortunately, that uh, there's something called parody law, and as long as you say that it's for parody. And you're obviously taking the Mickey out of it. You can use whatever you want. Like. Really? Oh, that's good because we just made an entire game and never actually asked. So yeah. it was. Yeah. It was quite I've, <laughs> I've got. I've got to say. I think the secret was we didn't think about no, it. We didn't. So we just went. No, so Star we Wars alien? or whatever. Ah, alien. Fine. Let's just put it in. And and I think it was a bit. It was probably a bigger problem than we thought. But it was just, look, you can't say that we're, we're actually doing Alien or The Matrix. Well, The Matrix was pretty yeah. close, but yeah. yeah, we just didn't ask. So, yeah. and, and I think at the point that we released, because nobody came and sued, we got away with it. So. And also, once again, South Park was doing that sort of stuff as yeah. well. But I think also, I'm not sure you'd get away with it quite so easily today because everyone's a bit more on it. Whereas back at the time, you know, Probably most of the movie students you didn't know what a video game was. And that's so that, they're not exactly keeping a close eye on it. I think that's why Microsoft didn't want to do a sequel, is the truth. Because Microsoft really were afraid that people were going to come after us. And, um, and it's so difficult now with licensing. So I don't think, I think that's part of the reason we've not made a sequel or it wasn't made. And talking about that mature content in the game, though, even though it was like, you know, full of like 
that kind of stuff. It was still very cartoony, though, as well. I mean, that was kind of a contrast that kind of stood out, I think. Immature, yeah, you can say it. It's fine, it's fine. <laughs> that schoolboy humour. Yeah, schoolboy yeah. humour, yeah, that's exactly, you know, it was never, nothing was ever meant to be offensive or it was just people having a laugh and it was quite a sort of, it was, it was that kind of school run atmosphere, a little bit of friends uh, all making a game together and we did stuff that made us laugh and stuff that yeah. Chris, Chris and Robin. And we, we were all the same age and it, we just all shared a similar sense of humour. I and mean, the, the rule of thumb is, you know, if it made you giggle, then the chance I would stay in. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, some of it, you know, it would just turn up some, some of the ideas and you'd just go, oh my God, yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> but uh, uh, some of the good things, that obviously, you know, we'd see the, these cutscenes would be made, you know, uh, Chris and Robin would disappear, or they'd, they'd been very, had a very loose idea of what they wanted to say, or, or quite a loose script. Uh, but in, most of it was just completely improvised up in the, the two of them like there they go I, I'd say all of it was improvised probably yeah. apart from the singing they just used to it was kind of like a comedy duo the Robin Beanland did all the music and all the sound effects and and with Chris Seaver the designer they just bounced stuff backwards and forwards in the studio and then cut the good stuff and what we'd always remember is that like um, as, as the game we you know we'd, we'd, we'd be making up the level or whatever and, and the bit of gameplay being added into it uh, and then we'd get very excited any time they'd come down and said, oh, we've done it, we've edited together, we've recorded the next cutscene. And obviously it hadn't been, and no visuals had been there, we'd just listen to the audio and everyone would huddle around and sort of snicker their way through whatever the latest cutscene was. And then a little bit later, the final cutscene would actually be put together and, and yeah. made. And quite often we'd be getting some good belly laughs out of whatever or oh my gods from it all. And, um, and then... Obviously, you know, it, it, over two, two and a half years of making it, we'd see the cutscene over and over and over again. But quite a lot of them, even like two years later, you'd, you'd have a little snicker <laughs> when you ever see them go, oh, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? Yeah, because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the audio would drive, drive the gameplay. Um, so um, I, I, I kind of was spoiled a little bit because I was the guy that sort of stitched all this stuff together. So I would sit with Chris Seaver and just make notes and notes. What are we going to do with this section? How is it going to work? So I always knew what the punchline was going to be. But I didn't know what the speech was going to be, but I, I, I had to put it together. And, and, and so a lot of it was spoilt for me because I knew, I knew what was going to happen before. But the other guys, sometimes you just show it to them on the team. You'd be sat there thinking, are they going to find it funny? And if everybody was just laughing their head off at the end of it, you were like, that's cool. I mean, we certainly overstepped the mark in some places. And, and now, now that we're a lot older and boring, uh, we'd probably go, oh, I'm not sure I'd say that anymore. But, and I think Chris Seaver always says that because I still work with him. And, and sometimes when we play bits, he goes, ooh, <laughs> ooh. <laughs> Well, uh, Conker kind of didn't take the game seriously himself and would, uh, in the glitched out section, would actually break the fourth wall and talk to the coder himself and programmer. Um, who came up with that idea? And well, you don't see that much, do you? Yeah, well, well Conker is Chris Seaver. Chris Seaver is Conker. It was like almost 100% him. Yeah. And that was something he did to us quite regularly. <laughs> it was like a conversation he'd have with us. You know, it'd be like, you know, whatever the game's broken, and he, and then he just had the uh, that idea of that when he got he got to the end, and the alien thing just went. All right, how do we get from here to where I need to be? I, I'm up in space. We're doing this. What are we going to do to get back to the final bit of the game, which we need to do? And then he just went. Well, let's just pretend the game's broken, and we just put all the cutscene support in for like all the the typing appearing and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it's getting quite hard for us to remember how all this stuff came about. Now we're reaching that right, dangerous no, age. Well, I am certainly. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it would have literally just be what Chris said. I mean, what we what we did with the game is we started at the beginning roughly, and we started at the end at the same time, and then we worked to the middle so that we could just get rid of the middle if we couldn't have time. You know, we just say, meanwhile, or sometime later. So um, that was really, it was, that was key to our success in managing to get it all done, was that we kind of worked from both ends. Yeah, and, there were a few levels that never made it in. And it oh, was yeah, just lots, like, lots of stuff that and, would have been really cool. Chris just goes, right, okay, that level's gone, that level's gone. We're, yeah. no, we're no longer going to inflate the pig with the bellows. It's fine. That's just, yeah, yeah. just going to go. And, uh, and we didn't mind. Yeah, but but Chris, Chris has just got an, an endless imagination. Chris Seaver, it's like honestly, it's it's just like joke after joke with this sort of thing, and he he could 
basically done anything. And an encyclopedic knowledge of movies. Yeah, yeah. He's got a photographic memory for movies. So he'd watch a movie. So a lot of the parodies, Chris had just watched the film. So he'd watch The Matrix on Wednesday, came in on Thursday and said, right, let's do The Matrix. Okay, it's a whole film. Yeah, well, let's just do it. Then he'd rough out an idea for, you know, what sort of gameplay was involved. But when it came to the cut scenes, he, he could sit and dictate what he'd seen, you know, at the cinema. Or, the, or he'd say something like, okay, you know that scene in, in Alien where they're, they're walking down that corridor and, that, the, and the sound of the, the wind like this? Or it sound like that. Yeah. So he could then get the DVD out and goes, oh, that's what's in his head. Yeah, and he, he still does that. He'll say to me, you know, because I work with him, he'll say, I need it to sound like, you know, the bit in Alien when all the, you know, the alien drops down from the ceiling and the chains are rattling, like that. And I'm like, okay, okay right, go and get the film. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds just like that. Well, did you have any previous voice acting experience? Uh, I don't think, well, Chris, Chris did. Chris uh, had been uh, um, in Star Fox, wasn't he, as the toad guy? Yeah. What's his name? Slippy. slippy, he was Slippy. That's so right. he did Slippy, uh, and he. Uh, it, everyone, it, it rare, we never hired voice actors. It was just like anyone, right? Anyone fancy doing this? Anyone got a silly voice? We were very cheap. <laughs> we were very cheap. <laughs> that was our number one feature. Yeah. We need some expensive voice acting. Get one no. of the programmers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure it's quite a, a well known fact, but Chris Siever did all the voices in, in Conquer Bar 2. I, I think what it is, is Chris Seaver's from Liverpool. So anybody who knows the Liverpool accent, it's, I can't do it, but it's, 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 it's quite try. distinct. But Chris doesn't sound like he's from Liverpool anymore. I think he's good at changing his voice. And so the, the way he used to demonstrate some of the gameplay is he'd come in and do it. He'd look quite literally bouncing up and down the corridors and doing the voices. And it's kind of just a natural thing. He's really good at, at accents. And so... Because we could pitch him all up and down and we could fiddle around with him, you could make him sound like everybody. I think it just started off at the beginning because he was cheap. And, and I think, he, you know, the idea would be that he'd probably do the voice of Conker. But to end up doing everything, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable, apart from Berry, yeah. which is the single I think he enjoys voice. doing ladies' voices as well, but it's, it, Berry was the one that we wanted it to sound yeah. properly feminine as opposed to, ooh, I'm all matey. Yeah. <laughs> well, what were some of your favourite phrases, and were they at any that were cut? Oh, oh God, the, the, it's, Conker's so quotable. Um, uh, now that's what I call a bowel movement, I suppose, is <laughs> this probably should be mine. <laughs> Sean? Um, I like the one jetpacks and butlers, because that means probably nothing to anybody outside of the team. So there's a lot of in-jokes in there, because... We used to have this thing, we used to have a bonus system at Rare. So you'd finish a game and when it sold, a certain percentage of the, the money would go to the team. And we went to a meeting once and one of the teams, one of the big teams, I don't know whether it was Donkey Kong 64 or Star Fox, a, a, a lot of bonus had been paid out. And it was kind of, if you lads work really hard, you can buy a nice car and a house. And we sort of came out. And I think um, one of the other teams, there was a guy called... Um, it's gone. But there was a designer, and he basically went, jetpacks and butlers for everyone, you know, kind of as a joke. And Chris picked it up and went, that's going in. Because <laughs> we all know what it means. Basically, you know, work today, jam tomorrow. Yeah, we arrived a bit late for the big bonuses at Rare, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but because but you, you always used to know when the uh, the bonuses had been paid, because one day suddenly a big, <laughs> big lorry would turn up and Lamborghinis and Ferraris <laughs> would all come out of it, and we go... Oh, yeah, okay, the bonuses have been paid, yeah. yeah. I'll just get back to work. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think the record, I think something like five Porsches turned up after one, one team had finished, and we were like, driving yellow. these crappy old, so excuse me, these uh, rubbish old cars and stuff. But uh, It's good motivation, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. But then when you find out years later that everybody had bought them on higher purchase and they all went back as the second they got married, it was kind of, uh, that made me feel a bit better. So, Well, could you give us a verse? Oh, the Great Mighty Poo. Does anyone want the Great Mighty Poo? No? <laughs> me, 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 me. I am the Great Mighty Poo, and I'm going to throw my dish at you. A huge supply of dish comes from my chocolate starfish. How about some scat, you little twin?
following on from that's quite difficult actually. <laughs> um, but I mean, obviously, there was so much in the game, you know, to graphics, the tracks, the samples, and everything as well. I mean, is that why obviously you went up to a 64 megabyte car? I mean, that must have you know added to the expense as well. I mean, when was that decision made? Uh, yeah, I, f I think um, what, what happened is one of the programmers said, I can do MP3. Uh, encoding so we could compress the speech small enough to get it on a cartridge so from that point on we said right everything's going to have speech in the game because um, it's really expensive to do and it just grew and grew and grew and we were we literally squeezed everything to death to try and fit it in but I think it was something like 42 meg of a 64 meg cartridge was audio I think it was higher than that actually it might have been 48 um, so basically, we couldn't have released the game. Well, we could have released the game on a tiny cartridge if we took all of the speech out. The speech was the killer. Um, it was just vast. Yeah, at the time, Grant Kirko on, on Banjo said it was impossible. Yeah, impossible to do. So we went right. Okay. Yeah, that, that was it. We're that's off. all we need to hear. Yeah. We're going to do this. He said you can't do, do full speech. Can't do full speech. No, it's got to be. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we go. No, I that's think we can a, do better. That's quite a good impression, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> hello, Grant. Um, we love you, Grant. Yeah, so they said, no, it's impossible. Nobody can do that. So off we went, and uh, we had a really cool guy called Mike Currington who wrote the MP3 uh, decoder. Um, so we managed to fit it all in. But, yeah, it was, it was touch and go. We wanted it turns out Grant was almost right. Yeah, it was, he, really he was almost close. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was unbelievably close. I mean, we were literally counting stuff in at the end to get it to fit. Um, but, yeah, we had to go to 64, and so the price was huge because a 64-bit cartridge just to manufacture was, was as, nobody was doing it. It's so, the biggest cartridge. Yeah, so I think that's why we ended up at like $60. And $60 was like a huge amount back then for a game. Um, so nobody bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Which makes it great for all the retro revival events. We can yeah. buy it for... <laughs> It was, it was released in 2001, and it was kind of one of the last 16 titles on the N64, but that led it to having really good graphics, because you guys must have kind of learned all the techniques and Yeah, tricks. we had, we had the, the benefit and the curse of being right at the end of the, the uh, console, because at the time, we'd had uh, like five years of experience of getting every single, every single thing out of that engine that it could do, everything, every, the, just absolutely everything that we could think of, and had even more time to think about of that sort of stuff. I mean, we did the entire game without a debugger for a start off, which was amazing because literally, I remember right at the very start, we had, uh, I think it was called Code Warrior, Code Work, something like that was the, was the debugger that came with the N64, uh, the Nintendo supplied one. And uh, Nintendo is 64, 64 bits, it's like, uh, but no one ever used it, it was only ever 32 bit um, registers, but they were, everyone used them as 64 bit registers and uh, Tony Wong, who we mentioned earlier, said, oh, I found this undocumented switch that if we turn it on, doubles the number of registers and, and give, makes us be able to do loads more optimizations, but we lose the debugger. And we're on, we'll take them, we'll take the registers, yeah. we're going to have them. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we did it all with we print statements. <laughs> we, we, <laughs> we had not, not a break point, not a... <laughs> It was very hard to use. But, but we, 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 we did some crazy things as well because the, the N64 uses this, for graphics, uses this separate sort of language. It's got separate processors that nobody knew about other than us, and, you know, dev teams. And uh, Tony just rewrote the whole of the, the microcode, it's called, so that we could have more lights than any other game. Now, we did that. It was just purely because it would look better and Tony was like, Let's do it. So he basically spent months and months rewriting this really... It, all, the, all the code was in Japanese. All so the instructions. All, so all, all, all the, the comments were in Japanese. The code was, was slightly better. There were some English words. But Tony basically figured this whole thing out, rewrote the, the lighting. Uh, we, we literally pushed it as hard as we possibly could. Yeah, uh, it's also why it's so hard to emulate. That's why it was one yeah. of the hardest games to emulate because we just did insane things that nobody el else yeah. had ever done, uh, like virtual memory. We had, I say, because it's uh, because it was um, it, it's a cartridge. We can whip things out in and out of the cartridge quite quickly. So we did crazy things like the um, the sky dome. That so when you look around, there's the whole sky that we had as a, as a, it was a massive texture that we had to chop up into little 4K textures because that was the biggest texture uh, the N64 could handle. And so we had all these little squares all the way around making up the sky dome, but we couldn't fit that in memory. So what we ended up doing was as, 
as we only sh loaded what you could see, and then as you turned your head around, we'd be throwing away textures on this side and loading them in on this side. Yeah. Um, so we just did e crazy e stuff. Everything was like that. The, the biggest hurdle we had was that we only had two meg of memory. Now, anybody who you know, who's into their tech now will just go, what? <laughs> you know, a single picture. Well, you couldn't even hold that in the whole of it. So we were really, really constrained by this fact. So everything we did was about how can we get this in, do its thing, get it out, get it in, do, you know, do its thing, get it out. So like all the animations in the game, when we do an animation, we load it off the cartridge at some point, then we use it, then we throw it away because we, we need that memory. So we, so we got this massive system going on in the background that's doing all this housekeeping. Yeah, we ended up, we ended up having, because there was only so much in the memory map for in this four mega memory that we could use, uh, there was only so much like for code, and we actually wrote more code than would fit in the space we had for code, so there was a virtual memory thing ripping code in and out yeah. as we were going along. I, I uh, hope some of you are following this. We're going yeah, off two, on yeah, a bit two of programmers a, bit of a sitting tech, up at the top going, techie yeah. rant here, but yeah, you can imagine. But a lot of it was that we... We didn't really know what was possible and what was impossible. So we'd have these ideas and we'd just go at it thinking it must be possible. Surely it's possible, you know, because there was, there was no internet at Rare. So you couldn't, you couldn't go on Google and go, right, how am I going to do this? It didn't exist at Rare. There was one machine in a broom cupboard. You had to book time on it. You, you had to fill to out a form. Form to say what you were looking, what you're looking for. You yeah, know. purpose of your internet search. Yeah, porn. Yeah. Yes. So, so yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. So, we yeah, Chris Siever probably wrote that. But um, so we basically had to invent stuff. So occasionally you'd be able to ask somebody on another team. Occasionally there were a couple. Of, we we always dealt with the Golden Eye lot. They were in the barn next to us. We were good friends. We had curries. So we shared odds and sods of code. They gave us their animation system. Chris and Mark Betteridge completely rewrote it and made it so fast that the whole company had to have it. They were like, give us it, give us it, you know. So there was a little bit of that, but we were insular and, and naive is the word I'm looking for. We just went for it. When it finally got approved by Nintendo, um, what did they remove? I know there was a Pikachu scene <laughs> that was removed. Yeah, there, were, there wasn't a lot removed. No. There wasn't a lot removed. There were certain scenes that are worse than others. One, one of the famous ones, and it, it tends to be like weird stuff, like you know, the, 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 the stuff we're sitting there going, you're allowing that in? And yet other scenes you go, oh, why are you not taking that out? But yeah, so there was one scene uh, where there was the weasel bosses and it does the whole sort of like uh, Sopranos uh, it, it, it mafia was, sort um, of stuff. It was the Unforgettables, wasn't it? Yeah. It's the bit where Robert De Niro clubs one of them to death with a baseball. So yeah, a baseball so, bat, not a baseball. Yeah. <laughs> a baseball, yeah. <laughs> That'd be weird. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that was... Yeah, uh, so, uh, and so we had a little Pikachu tail coming across. And then one of them gets out a baseball bat and just bats yeah. off screen, bats it yeah, to death, blood everywhere, and goes, you got to catch them all. <laughs> yeah. So we thought, this is cool. Well, that's funny. This will definitely go, Nintendo won't have Nintendo a problem with this. Nintendo will love that. Yeah. And they just went, we and licensed nope. this stuff. <laughs> nope. Take it out. Another one was, the, the, there was the, there's a scene where the pitchfork gets hung. Yeah. Oh. And, it, and one of the guys says prior to it, we're going to have a lynching. And it sort of cuts to these two guys, and they've got Ku Klux Klan <laughs> hats on. And we were like, yeah, it's really funny, the Ku Klux Klan. And I think somebody in America just went, you don't want to mess with the Klan. <laughs> so that came out. <laughs> Was there anything that got through that you didn't think would? I'm not sure whether I can say these sort of things, because well, we'll probably get sued now. But <laughs> No, I mean, I mean like the guy in the electrocution, who gets electrocuted oh, in the electrocution chair, um, yeah. although we had to make him survive at the end. No, so I think that was... I, was I, that in the remake? I, I think in the original one, the electrocution nice. scene, there's a little teddy, uh, uh, a squirrel that gets electrocuted in a chair. And I think in the original, it's like 30 seconds of him going... <laughs> oh, 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 oh. His eye falls and out. Eye <laughs> popping out and all sorts of stuff. And, um, and then he... I, I think he dies perhaps yeah. in the original, but in when Microsoft came along, they went, "Oh, this is yeah. a bit brutal, yeah. isn't it?" So he has to, he survives, and it's yeah. much shorter. But, but in case you're wondering, you always choose the wrong switch. You you can't choose the right switch at that scene. You always oh kill, yeah yeah it's you will loaded. always kill that squirrel. Yeah, it's loaded. <laughs> yeah yeah. 
yeah. but I mean, the vivisection scene got taken out. Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's there's a bit in that same scene, that same section in the the hospital when you walk in to the uh, operating room. Now, when we first had that cut scene, uh, it was is it got the teddies in the little surgeon masks and they've got the scalpels out and there's a squirrel on the table. And you, they're actually operating on him live, and he's like, and there's like blood everywhere again. And then he goes, and they went, eh, maybe that's a bit too much. So that's when it got changed to the completely weird, just the random scene of them going, oh, what would, what would intelligent people do? As if it was like offset on a, on a movie set, you wandered into it, oh, get into character, get into character, and that sort of stuff. So uh, there was probably a lot of stuff cut along the way that I just can't remember where. We'd, we'd put it in, and then even people on the team would get offended by it or something. And I, I mean, to tell you the honest truth, I can't think of Chris removing something because somebody on the team would be offended by it. It's just go, kind of, <laughs> grow up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going in. If the person who made it offended themselves, that would be a question. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think Chris probably is of that mind now. He He's looks offended at future, Chris. Chris yeah. future Chris. Yeah. Has yeah. Future Chris has looked back a few times and yeah. shook his head at past Chris. But... Um, well, Nintendo wouldn't promote the game, so being a mature rated game, did you guys kind of aim for different areas, and how did the Playboy um, kind of stuff work? Well, Beaver, <laughs> well, well, Beaver is a is a is a exotic magazine that, uh, that used to be in the UK, as far as I'm aware. Or and uh, so yeah, one of the, if you don't know, one of the things he gets a magazine out and you look at it and it's like a. The big yeah, fat busted slightly sort of adult, <laughs> adult like sort adulty, adulty. So yeah, so he's got an adult magazine. I don't think that made it. It's in strange actually remake. because before I came here, I found and I didn't know I had it. I had some some old design documents from Chris, and one of them was it was Nintendo. It was an official Nintendo document, and it said how to market this game, and it was like. What are we going to do? <laughs> this, it's, this game is so unlike anything Nintendo have ever done. And I haven't read it for, for 20 years. And I'm looking at it, and you can see the fear of, like, <laughs> this doesn't really fit into the way we make games, you know, Nintendo. And da-da-da, how should we sell it? And I think what happened is basically they thought, oh, God, we, we, don't, we don't know what to do <laughs> to sell this game. Perhaps if we, it will sell itself. So they kind of took a step back from it but this document it was it's quite interesting because you can see the the marketing guys are like we don't know what to do with this <laughs> it's not nintendo really um but you know we we had a bit of a push and and we we shift we shifted a an okay amount of cartridges and certainly the company got paid really well for the work that we'd done so um but but it's made it really scarce i mean the game was promoted in other ways i mean wasn't it promoted in playboy yeah, I think that's the American sort of side. Yeah. See, the Amer Nintendo of America loved it. Yeah, they well, they yeah, but even again, they they kind of they just pushed it as this sort of really adult adult game, and it it, it wasn't really a a really good marketing scheme for it because Playboy, who who reads Playboy and plays games? It's like really, no. is <laughs> you know, is there any? Yeah, yeah, two. <laughs> So it was a bit of a strange one. I mean, to tell you the honest truth, we were so burnt out at the end of it that we were like, whatever. And we just went home. I mean, my, my first son was born like two weeks after we'd, we'd finished the game. So I hadn't seen my wife. I just went home and went, what's that bump? <laughs> <laughs> Who's this bump? <laughs> well, Conker's Live and Reloaded was um, basically with Microsoft. And how, how did the attitude change? Uh, what were they like? Uh, they were pretty good. I mean, Microsoft, when they took over, um, they, they relaxed a huge amount. They were a little bit new games, so they were a bit, little bit more hands on the and a little bit more used to pushing out Office than pushing out video games. So it was a very different way that people worked. So it was a little bit of getting used to each other there. And uh, obviously now they're amazing at it. But at the, at the time, it was the very first time sort of coming into it. But a lot of sort of uh, the flack that's thrown against Live and Reloaded wasn't really Microsoft's fault at all, other than the fact that Microsoft is a massive company that people like to sue. And they just people sue Microsoft all the time because they're a big company, they've got lots of money. So um, when we came to do Live and Reloaded, the original idea that it was going to be uh, Live and Uncut, that was the original title of it. And the idea is, oh, we'll throw some extra scenes in and do some extra bits yeah. and bobs on it. Um, and unfortunately, Microsoft are in, if you change anything, it reopens it up to be re-examined for parody law yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And people 
will be able to, it's a big game people know about it movie studios are a lot more used to suing people now and you pushed the boundaries rather closely the last time so um really there was a lot of stuff that we can do and plus and so uh, some of the scenes chris just we, we tweaked some of the gameplay elements made it a bit easier because it's the n64 game is hard it yeah. is really really difficult so we did a little bit of things there was a lot of people who played conquer and didn't get off the training level a lot of people that controller probably didn't help. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, the problem is, we, we put all the hardest jumps in the first level and then never use them again. Yeah, like, yeah, because we, we, <laughs> we, we, we didn't want it to be a jumping game. But, but the other thing was, um, that a lot of people probably don't realise, is that it just started out, we wanted to make a multiplayer game. So we wanted to make an Xbox Live game. So we said, well, can we use the Conquer Universe and do it? So internally, we'd kind of started doing that work. But to, the only way we could get it greenlit was to say we'll redo the the original game as kind of an extra from our point of view it was just something we were going to bolt on to the for fans, to yeah. the multiplayer because we were really into the multiplayer we thought we can do something really cool with we, all these characters we played quake, quake through arena a lot uh, yeah well, that was kind of a, that was the thing that chris was playing loads of quake through arena yeah and, and Mike, like, yeah let's do one of these microsoft wanted xbox live so we started off like that so chris and myself who'd worked we were we were the only two original programmers because there were seven on the original game so we came in and um, we didn't look at the single player. We had, a, we had a group of new start guys from straight from university mostly. And we said, look, guys, can you get this working for us? You know, because we couldn't get it work. We didn't have yeah. the time. And, and so that was kind of being developed separate to us. We, we were upstairs yeah. doing multiplayer, and they're downstairs doing the remake of Conquer. And then Microsoft were kind of, they started to get a bit more touchy-feely, like, can we see what's going on? You know, they were certainly unlike um, Nintendo. But they were still good guys. They were all gamers. You know, the original Xbox guys, Ed Freeze and all the rest, mm, they, were, they were gamers. You know, they were people you could talk to, and they knew their history of, of what yeah. was going on. It was Chris and Tim who said, it has to have a single player. We can't just do the yeah, reloaded yeah. bit. Yeah. Uh, and then we, there, was a, there was just a couple of Xbox rules that meant that they couldn't release the game if it had certain words. So we had to add a few more. But it's not many. It's actually not many. Yeah, because I, I, was, I was listening to Live and Reloaded, and everybody's going, oh, you removed all the swearing, and there's plenty of cursing in there. There's, in just, there. there's certain words that you can't put in Microsoft you know, the games think, without them going to an 18. Plus, also, what had happened is all the, all the rating stuff had kicked in. Mm. You know, in 90... Well, 2000, it wasn't a big thing, but certainly there was starting to be a backlash against, you know, rude stuff in games and violence and whatever. So Microsoft, you know... They probably hinted at us, but I, I think the ultimate decision came down to the, you know, Chris Seaver and, and, you know, the management at Rare who said, look, we don't want to go to a, be an 18 game. Yeah, there was. I mean, I think also one of the most obvious ones where the, there's been added stuff was the Great Mighty Crew song, where there was, there was extra words beeped out. So it's quite up in your face as a place that it's changed. The rest is actually quite subtle yeah. and, and, and not a lot been added. Uh, uh, but. It was on the subtitles as well. Yeah, it was on the subtitles, yeah. so we had to, to beep out the subtitles as well. But, yeah, I mean, even, even for the N60, I think it was on the N64 one where there was stuff that we'd, they, we pushed back a few times on, on stuff. Well, Chris, Steve would have pushed back a few times on stuff. And they literally said, if you keep that in the game, it can only be sold in sex shops. <laughs> yeah. went, okay, that might, that might restrict our audience <laughs> yeah, to touch. Yeah, it was like, rap, this, you know, <laughs> that was it. But, you know, Microsoft weren't the bad guys in it. It, was, it, it, it would have come down to a mutual thing. And sometimes... You know, with the best will in the world, you've got to bend, you know, to get the game out. And certainly, we, we play it now, and I, I think it's funnier. It's just like, yeah, I know what he's saying under there. It's not, it's not difficult, is it? It's like... <laughs> <laughs> well, do you think Conker's Bad Fur Day would be published today if it was a new game? I think, I think if, if it hadn't existed before and we just invented this new game called Conquest by Fur Day, we would be sued to hell. Yeah, we wouldn't stand it. a chance it, it of cost, that It costs like billions of dollars. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you want the Matrix, right? That's like 50 <laughs> billion, <laughs> and you want the whatever, uh, Alien, yeah, that's 20 million. You know, Microsoft would go, guys, look, we spent all our money. <laughs> and, you know, the humour is a little bit childish, you know, so it's a little bit immature, and maybe the people have matured a little bit more. Of that. I mean, it's still funny, but there's, I think, it came out at the perfect time. It was out of nowhere. It was this just this magic little thing that appeared that was completely, yeah. completely different to anything else. And that's I'm, really nice to have as part of your history that it's something that you've been involved in and that was just a, 
a magic thing of its yeah. time. One of the best things that happens to me is I now go, I, I remember the reviews we got for the game and they were pretty brutal from the UK press. We got some really terrible low scores, yeah. And now I read... Find six out of ten. No, but <laughs> now I look at it. Yeah, six out of ten, four out of ten, whatever. You know, they were kind of mediocre. But now we're getting like ten out of ten, nine out of ten, where they Classic go back game. 20 years ago, the greatest game ever made about a squirrel. Ten out of ten. It's like, you gave us four out of ten. I remember <laughs> you. And if I ever see you, I'm going to remind <laughs> you of that fact. <laughs> Well, we have got a few minutes. If we have uh, any questions, just put your hand up and uh, we'll run over with a microphone. Yeah, we've got a few. Uh, hello again. Um, I was uh, just wondering, like a question idea, like there's like many crossover games like Mars vs. Capcom, Super Smash, Smash Brothers. Uh, do you think it's like a, like a good idea to put like Conquer along with a character like Duke Nukem? I'd like a Capcom vs. Rare. I could see it. I'd love it. <laughs> but... <laughs> Uh, they tend to be for other studios to do and not for us. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be the sort of thing that Rare would do, I imagine. But I w I'll say, once again, Banjo and Smash is the, is the best example I can think of. I couldn't think of a better, con well, other than Conquer, obviously, in Smash, uh, a, a way of like combining those things. Uh, I mean, the um, Killer Instinct got remade just recently, and, uh, and that was great, and you just only got Battletoads came into that. And that's what we like to do. We like to drop little things, you know, e even in like Sea of Thieves, we have lots of rare heritage that we pull back into the game and we've just literally just released the Halo set on Sea of Thieves. So we just pull things in. That, that's kind of how we like to pay homage to the... And Conquer's um, kind of a, a niche thing as well. It's, it's a cult game. It's got a lot of fans and, and the rest of it, but... It's just between you and us. Yeah, it's all yeah, just pretty much. Us. But as a... But as a major IP, I, f I think people probably think it's higher than than it actually was, you know, or that sh that people would get it. And I, I don't know. I, we, we get a lot of people now that go, I, I only played it like six months ago. This is great. Yeah. You know, that's really nice. That's that makes you feel really good. Perhaps we did something special. Yeah, it, it's lovely to know that it, any any time when a fan so comes up and just said, yeah, yeah, I played it. You know, whether it was six months ago or you know when there was seven. <laughs> mature rate game everybody yeah. seven was not the time That's to it. play we're going to have to hunt you down <laughs> <laughs> but it's just fantastic for some to come up and say you know it had an impact on me it's one of my favourite games and yeah. just, it's nice to be a part of that yeah I mean we're immensely proud of it yeah, I'm, I, you know I work with Chris Seaver every day and we still talk about it we're very fond of it you know we could he comes up with, with ideas that can make another conquered game you know any time but it's does it really warrant it so we're kind of happy that he's kind of the thing we made i think we'd be quite upset if somebody else made it um if i if i tell the truth you know we want to make it if anybody's going to make it it's us you know? it's, it's always hard that sort of sequel game when you sit there going like, it, it, it's yeah. always going to be yeah. compared to the i wouldn't original have done one. that I, oh, we, yeah, we'd have done it better than that. that's not that's not my sequel hashtag not no. my sequel uh, we've yeah. got you know, another question oh, sorry <laughs> just down here I, I think we need to shorten down the answer okay. to get you we've got this. another couple of hours yeah 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 yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> got the whole day you know <laughs> you would if we just yeah, if you give us a chance uh you say you want to focus on new ips uh would you ever consider going into the art section again and doing something like you know, cuddly like Conka and doing something r raunchy and uh, a little bit on the edge. Um, because if I remember from last year, you were talking about uh, Nutty the Chipmunk. Oh, oh right. I, well, I could probably... Could, because uh, Conka is really Chris Seaver. And, and with, without Chris, I, I think you'd struggle to get that. You know, it takes the vision of one person to drive these things. So I work with Chris a lot. And I should repeat the question, would we make another conquer type he game so chris chris often talks about doing something in that kind of vein not conquer though because we you know we're a we're a different little company there's two of us so we could never do conquer because it's owned by microsoft so chris certainly would like to do something along that you know we still think it's a rich vein for a game but we're two guys so we can't we can't make conquer <laughs> yeah and as far as rare goes you know we wouldn't say no to anything we look for the the where the, the most entertainment is, of course, it's more useful if you keep it. You, you're always going to get a broader audience, like uh, could have made Sea of Thieves with blood and guts and all this kind of stuff in there. And, but there, and there are people who will target for that, but um, we want it as broad as possible 
um, to get the the players in, so you get the most amount of stories out of it and that sort of thing. So uh, it's, it, but you know, would we ever make a, a perfect dark like super dark perfect dark? Sounds great to me. But we have time for two more questions, yeah. if we're quick. <laughs> so okay. the, I heard stories where they were showed the demo or prototype build to like the Japanese president and the. American president Howard Lincoln and Minoru Awakawa and like the Japanese Awakawa laughed hilariously while the other wasn't really thrilled about it. Do you know anything more about that? And which one was which? I don't know this story. I don't know. I, I, I mean, <clears throat> Hume is a strange one. Um, Conquer is very much a British game. It's, it's British humour. And so unless you share that, you know, somewhere like Canada probably would get it really well you know it, because canadian humor to me you know i can watch canadian humor and i get it as a, as a brit but america it's completely different they, they they don't really get satire um that well it's just not something that's delivered in their comedy system so a lot of people didn't really get conquer um in america and and i think it's probably the same everywhere i don't i don't know what the what the humor is like here i'd like to think you're i'd like to think you've got that kind of you know sort of quirky stuff because american humor to me does nothing but in a similar though although um i'm not sure about that meeting we did have c bulmer at the time who was uh vice president of microsoft he just he just flown to see the russian president and on his way back he popped into rare and we all came in on a saturday to sort of show him around the studio and he sat down and we had to just show him a bit of Conquer this yeah. just before it came out. And we were showing him the, um, the, the Saving Private Ryan beach run-up cutscene. So he just, stayed, I just sat there like that. And he was laughing his head off at the end of it. Just yeah. absolutely, yeah. That, absolutely that. killing him. He just went, yeah. how are we going to sell that? Yeah. And he's just killing himself. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's not cut and dry, it's certainly. But, you know, perhaps the Japanese humor is slightly more European, you know, um, than American style. But, you know... Each to their own. Uh, one more. Uh, I have a question. In this game, it starts out with you with a hangover, right? And you fight a giant poo. So it's a lot in this game. So I wonder, does did was some of this uh, working with the game somewhat disturbing? Was it something that you find that we shouldn't really don't should do that? This is now we're crossing a line. <laughs> okay, what's the game? Did the, I suppose that question is, did the game disturb us? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> we yeah. were disturbed to begin with, yeah, to be yeah, fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, think, I think there were a couple of people on, on the team um, that were probably a little bit more sort of religious and a little bit more straight-laced than we were, and I think we probably offended them a bit, but they just kept quiet and got on with their work. <laughs> Whereas the rest of us, it was... We all had a very similar sense of humour, yeah, which and, helped. Yeah, and we were all sort of in our late late twenties, you know. Well, coming, you know, mid to late twenties, and and South Park was such a big thing, and we all just used to sit after we worked all day. We'd watch South Park at eleven o'clock at night or something, watch an episode, and that was that was quite good. That sort of gave us the view: well, you can get away with just yeah. about <laughs> anything. If so, they can do it, so can we. Yeah. So, um, but I don't. I, we just all shared a similar sort of humour. We were lucky. We had it was just a really good team, you know, and, and that was it. You couldn't wish for better people to work with, really. So I miss a lot of them. Well, guys, I think we could easily do another hour or two with uh, yes. you guys again more stories. It's been amazing. Book two hours <laughs> next time. <laughs> yeah. We have reached the end of our time, but uh, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Please give a big thank you to Chris and Sean. Sure.